Hey everybody, welcome to Dome to Home. We are excited to have you here today. We're gonna to be talking about the craziest exoplanets. It's gonna be super fun. We're gonna wait just a minute for people to kind of get logged in and refresh their screens if you need to. We'll wait just a second here. Yeah, Hope hello, everybody welcome great. everybody. All right, hopefully everybody's in now. So for those of you who just made it, hi, welcome to Dome to Home. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm a presenter here at the Fisk Planetarium. I also have Jeremy here with me. Say hi, Jeremy. Hello, everybody. Uh, I also work at Fisk Planetarium doing some out going on outreach trips, giving presentations and uh, doing some navigating, which is what you'll be seeing today. Everything on the uh, screen up here. Uh, will be controlled live by myself and then Tara up above me is going to be talking to you guys and dropping some excellent knowledge on you about the wackiest and weirdest exoplanets out there. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. So yeah, thanks for joining us today for the weirdest exoplanets. Figured we'd start off by answering the easy question, what is an exoplanet? So an exoplanet basically is just a planet that's going around a star that isn't ours. Our sun is our star. There's lots of other stars out in the sky and lots of them have planets going around them. And those are all in the category of exoplanets. And that's what you see here on the dome over here. If you're having trouble seeing the dome there, if it looks really small to you, you might maximize your screen, go ahead and put it full screen so you can see really well. Well, we've got some artist renditions of some exoplanets up there for you. We don't actually know what exoplanets look like, per se. We don't actually have pictures of them. We're going to talk about it in a minute, why that is. But these are just drawings and kind of conceptions of what we think exoplanets might look like. Pretty cool. Now, one thing we do know is what planets in our solar system look like. And I thought we would take a look at the planets in our solar system real quick to kind of get some, some scale and some concept of how planets are arranged around stars. So Jeremy's gonna go ahead and blast us off the surface of the earth here. Now hold on. You can see our beautiful Milky Way in the sky there. That is our home galaxy. And here is our big, beautiful Earth coming up beneath us. And you can see our sun there in the back. There we go. Now, of course, the Earth is just one planet in our solar system. So we're going to zoom out a little bit so you can see all of the planets. Leave the Earth behind. You can see our moon there, too. Bring up all these uh, colored rings, which mark the orbits of the different planets, the path that these different planets take around the sun. Yeah. So there's all of the planets in our solar system. And you'll notice if you know a little bit about planets, which I'm guessing you probably do, up close to the sun, there's Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Those are all of our rocky planets. They're very Earth-like. They got a lot of rocks and metals and things like that. But as we move farther out, you get the big giant gas planets like Jupiter and Saturn. And then even farther out, there's Uranus and Neptune, which are also giants, and they're made out of a lot of gas and ice. Sometimes they're called ice giants. And this is the same kind of setup that we see with most of the planetary systems that we find. There's going to be a lot of rocky planets that are really close to the star, and then the bigger ones are farther out. But there are some exceptions. And we'll talk about those too. Now, these exoplanets in particular are everywhere. It's not, we've found thousands of exoplanets. So these are planets that are going around, like I said, stars that are not our sun. We've done a couple of cool surveys. There's telescopes out in space that are specifically looking for these exoplanets. There was one out there for a really long time called Kepler. Kepler was great. He was out and studying exoplanets, looking for exoplanets. And you can see here on the sky, 
there'll be some colored dots appearing. And each one of those colored dots is a star that Kepler found a planet going around, at least one planet. Some of them had two or three or seven. So you can see there's a couple starting to appear there. Orient around here a little bit. Sometimes I get lost when I'm looking up at the, the nighttime sky, so it can be, be a little tricky. There we go, there's that big bright field. Yeah. And yeah, you can locate it if you can find the uh, Cygnus the Swan flying down the Milky Way. That's a good way to remember where that Kepler field is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at one point Kepler's motor broke and he just stared at the same patch of sky for a really long time. But look how many planets he found. Tons and tons of them. And then you can see there's all sorts of dots all over the other place too. So there's over 4,000 exoplanets that we found so far. Well, that's a lot. And like I said, it's really hard to find an exoplanet. We can't just look at a star and look and wait for a planet to go around it, see a planet around there. We can't just look out and take a picture of it. So what we do is we use something called the transit method. And this is what Kepler uses. And there's a brand new telescope called TESS that does the same thing. Basic idea is that planets compared to stars are really, really tiny. So it's hard to see a planet because stars are so big and so bright. But even the really small planets, when they move in front of a star, they will block some of the star's light. And you can see kind of on the diagram here, if we're looking at how bright that star is, when a planet moves in front of it, that brightness will kind of dip a little bit. And then when the planet goes on, it brightens up again. And big planets make bigger dips, little planets make smaller dips. And so by just looking at how bright the star is and waiting for a planet to move in front of it, we can tell that there's the planet there. We can get a somewhat of an idea of about how big it is. Now this does lead us to some problems though. Because this is our main way of doing it, it's a little bit biased. When we're looking at these stars and waiting for planets to go around it, like I said, the big planets are gonna block a lot more light. So it's a lot easier for us to find the really big planets. It also helps if they're really big and really close to their star. They're going to block the most light and it helps if it's not a very bright star because then we can see those little planets in the dips a lot better. So it's a little biased in the planets that we do find. We see a lot of really big planets. Jeremy's put up this little population chart here. You can see there's a couple different kinds. Now on the bottom there, it shows you how quickly that planet goes around its star. And you can see that we're finding a lot of planets that go around their star really fast. That means they're really close to the star. And on the vertical axis, it shows you how big those planets are. And again, you can see that we're finding a lot more of the big planets than the small ones. The small ones only make the small dips in the star's light. And so they're a lot harder for us to find. But you can see that we found tons of them. And there are a couple other ways that we can find exoplanets, but that transit method is how we do almost all of them. Almost all of the exoplanets that we found have been through that transit method. So this just kind of gives you a general idea of what the population of the exoplanets are like and the way that we categorize them. There's the lava worlds and the rocky planets. There's the hot Jupiters up there at the top. And then in the middle, we have ocean worlds, ice giants, and then cold gas giants too. So we're gonna talk a little bit about each one of these, but I wanted to show you kind of how they look on this chart and where they kind of fall in the spectrum. So the first ones that I wanted to talk about are actually maybe not the craziest exoplanets that we find. These are some of probably the most interesting ones though. And this is a system called the TRAPPIST system. The star is called TRAPPIST-1, and there's seven planets that we have found going around this star. Now, TRAPPIST is about 40 light years away. It's in the constellation of Aquarius. You can see Jeremy put the, the stick figure up there for you, so you can kind of get an idea of where that is. We're actually going to fly out to the TRAPPIST system. We can get a good look at it. And for the sake of time, we're going to be flying a little bit later in the show. So let's go ahead and just uh, teleport, use this, the power of the planetarium, planetarium to just zip on over there faster than the speed of light. So here we are at the tra uh, TRAPPIST system, 40 light years away from home.
like magic. So yeah, you can see there's seven rings around there, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, seven little planets going around that star. Now that star is a little bit different than our sun. It's much smaller and it's much dimmer. And so it's a lot cooler too. So that means that these planets that are all going around this star can actually exist closer to the star than planets do to our sun because the star is a lot cooler. It's not giving off as much heat. And so these little planets going around aren't gonna burn up if they get really close to the star. And so we have a lot of evidence that these planets in the Trappist system are pretty rocky and similar to those planets that are close to our star, Mercury, Venus, Earth, things like that. Now we haven't found anything that's Earth-like per se. There's, we haven't found any uh, detections of liquid water or anything like that. But as far as rocky planets, there's seven of them, which is pretty cool. And I think we've got a picture here we can show you kind of how they're laid out compared to the ones here on Earth. Yeah, so you can see they're much, much closer to the star. There's two of them right in close, just in the orb inside the orbit of Mercury. And they're all seven of them crammed in close between what we would see as our sun and Mars. They're all kind of smushed in there. I think that's pretty cool. That's probably one of the more exciting ones that we found because it has A, so many of these small planets that we were able to find and B, because they are all kind of rocky. And that's one of the cool things that we look for when we're talking about exoplanets, because you know, we're always trying to find something that's kind of Earth-like, just to know that we're not the only ones out there. So these Trappist planets are really, really cool. But I also wanted to tell you guys about some of the weirdest exoplanets out there because that's the title, right? Weirdest exoplanets. So the first one we're going to go to is a planet called Corit 7b. This is the way that we name exoplanets is kind of weird. They name them after their star and then the first one they find is B. So this is the first exoplanet they found going around a star called Corit 7. So it's Corit 7b. The core at seven is in, kind of close to the constellation of Orion. I bet you a lot of you guys are familiar with the constellation Orion. It's getting hard to see this time of year, but it's still up there. And that's where core it's going to be found. Now core at 7b is one of those lava worlds. It's very, very close to its star. It's 23 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun. It's like right up on top of it. And so, of course, it's going to be really, really, really hot. It's also pretty, pretty comparable Earth size. It's about one and a half times the size of Earth. But again, very, very close to its star, very, very hot. Because it's so close, it orbits around that star in only 20 hours. So a whole year on this planet only lasts 20 hours, which is pretty crazy. So you'd be a lot older on this planet. Is that what you're saying right now? I'd be, I'd be like... Very, very old. <laughs> but you'd live so much longer. You would live forever, yeah. <laughs> Time's weird like that. Now, when we're talking about lava worlds like this, you see, these are all just artist conception. We don't actually have pictures of it, but we have a good idea that it might be pretty nasty like this because the average temperature on this planet is about 2,800 degrees. And just for a reference, the melting temperature of granite is 2200 degrees. Now most of the Earth's crust is made out of granite and so if we put Earth in this same position the entire planet would pretty much be melted. So that's what we're thinking is going on with this kind of rocky or it's 7b here. It's got to be pretty pretty hot, probably very melted. Not a pleasant place to live, I don't think. Not so much. Now we're gonna keep on moving because I've got a couple others that I wanna show you. So that was kind of rocky planets and a lava world, but now we're gonna talk about those hot Jupiters. Now these are planets that we don't really see in our solar system, but we call them hot Jupiters because they are really big and gassy like Jupiter, but they're also very close to their star. This is not something that we see here in our solar system, at least not now but we think it might be an important kind of step in the formation of a solar system. 
And we're actually going to head out and visit one right now called Kepler 70b. So we're going to fly through this Kepler survey that he took and go find this star. And like Jeremy showed you earlier, this big patch of sky is close to the constellation of Cygnus. And so that's where Kepler 70 is. You're going to find it close to that swan in the sky. So we're heading out that way. And as you were flying through all these uh, markings where we've uh, identified other exoplanetary systems, you'll notice that the colors are changing. And I believe, Tara, it's because the colors are just a measure of distance from the Earth. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Right. For this okay. survey, the different colors show you how far away it is. Right. And so you could see the differences as we're getting further out, they're changing. But then when we're looking at it from Earth, it looks like it's just all kind of on like a flat plane or a flat piece of paper. Uh, but when in reality, just like the stars, a lot of things are actually quite far away from each other. Space is tricky like that. Space is tricky like that. All right, so here we are coming up on Kepler 70. The star's name is Kepler 70. I believe it is this white little dot. We're getting closer. And there we go. See some planets orbiting that star. There you go. So you can see there's two planets out there. We're going to talk about the first one in 70b because this is the hottest exoplanet that we have found so far. Now I told you the melting point of granite is 2200 degrees. That last planet was 2800 degrees. Kepler 70b is 13,000 degrees. It is so hot. There's some pictures you can see there. It's so hot and it's so close to its star that we think that that star is actually blowing off some of the atmosphere of the planet. Now that planet's just made out of gas and so it's kind of shrinking as the wind comes off of that star and blows off the outer layers of the planet. So it might actually be getting smaller and smaller. Now it's at about 1% of the distance between the Earth and the Sun. We call that, the distance between the Earth and the Sun, we call an astronomical unit. This planet is 100 times closer to its star than the Earth is. How crazy is that? And it's huge. It's so close, it has a five hour year on this planet. It goes around its star once every five hours. So you would be super, super old <laughs> if you were living on Kepler 70b. Now we're getting short on time, so I want to show you guys one more really quick because I think this is one of the weirdest and most interesting exoplanets that we've found so far. This one is called WASP 12b. So it's around a star called WASP. Now it's also a hot Jupiter, but it's a little bit different. Like Jupiter, our Jupiter, the one in our solar system is made mostly out of hydrogen and helium, some ammonia and some nitrogen. But WASP-12b is a Jupiter that also has a lot of hydrogen and helium, but it also has a lot of carbon in it and it makes it black. It's a whole giant black planet, pitch black. It's so dark that it absorbs 94% of the sunlight that hits it. And so it's another one that's super, super hot. It's not quite as hot as Kepler, the last one. This one's only about 4,000 degrees. Only. Only. <laughs> only. But again, it's another one that's very, very close to its star. Now it's so close to its star that the gravity from the star is actually pulling material off the planet. Like we saw Kepler, the wind from the star was blowing material out. This one is actually sucking material in. And again, these are just pictures. These are not actual images. These are the ones that people drew. But you can see a comparison there on the right. It's bigger than Jupiter. And again, very, very close to its star. So it's kind of being eaten by its star. The thing that I think is super cool about this particular exoplanet is because it's so big and it has so much carbon in it, we think that at the very center of it, it's got to be really, really high temperatures, really, really high pressures. And what do you get when you take carbon and put it under high temperature and high pressure? You get diamonds. So this 
giant gas planet may have a core made out of diamonds at the center. Like, how crazy is that? I think that is so cool. It is pretty wild. Yeah. Space is nuts. Would that mean then, would the value of diamonds, would they not be that valuable on this planet if if mm. there were some beans that lived there? Or would maybe like normal rocks be more more valuable there? You know? And by normal, I mean like rocks that you might just find walking around outside here in Colorado mm. or wherever you, you viewers may be. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And maybe even if there are a lot of diamonds at the center of this planet, they're gonna be really hard to get to. Because mm. again, super, super hot and the core, because it's so big, the core of that planet's gonna be way, way down at the center. So it's gonna be hard to get to them. And those are just a couple of the crazy exoplanets there are out there. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to talk about all of them because they're all wacky in their own way. Now, aside from the super hot ones, there's also super cold ones. The farther you go out, the cold Jupiters that are more like our Jupiter, also ice giants that are really similar to Neptune and Uranus. And so these are all a little more familiar to you. But definitely check out NASA's website. They have a lot of great information about all of these weird exoplanets. Now that's about all the time we have for me to discuss with you, but I wanted to see if people had any questions that I could answer about some of these weird exoplanets or about exoplanets in general. I did see we had one before the show started from Penelope who wants to know what's the hottest and coldest exoplanets we found. So the hottest one is the one that I talked about that Kepler 7, or sorry, yeah, Kepler 70b is the hottest one. That was 13,000 degrees. The coldest one, I actually tried to find this yesterday when I was looking before the show and I had a hard time getting a good idea of what would be the coldest exoplanet. There's not a lot of really easy information out there, but we were talking about it some and we think that there's probably the closest thing we could find to the coldest exoplanet would actually be a rogue planet. Rogue planets are kind of like exoplanets. They're planets that are not going around any star. They're just out in space, kind of cruising around. And we found, or I think we have evidence for some of these, that they do exist. They are out there. We just don't know a whole lot about them just yet. But because they're not close to any stars, there's nothing giving them any heat. So they're probably really, really cold. So that's, that's kind of what we as a group decided would be the coldest exoplanet. I see Denise asks, how do we know if a planet is rocky or gassy? And that is an excellent question. Um, for these exoplanets, it's tricky because they are so far away. Generally, um, the easiest way to tell is by how big it is. If we find something that's super, super, super huge, it's almost certainly mostly made of gas because it's really hard to get something that's rocky that's the size of Jupiter. We haven't found anything like that anywhere in our universe yet. But we can also tell because they have gravity. Every planet has gravity, everything has gravity, but we can kind of get an idea of how dense a planet is by how much its gravity affects the things around it. So if you had a planet that was the size of Jupiter that was as close as some of these exoplanets that we found, if it was completely made of rock, it would be incredibly dense and it would cause that star to wobble around. The gravity from the planet would actually affect the star and have it kind of wobble around like that. So if we can see that star moving, we can get an idea of how big and how dense a planet could be. Now, because we don't see a ton of this huge wobbling, like I said, most of the, the really big planets that we're finding are pretty gassy. We can also use a tool called spectroscopy if we can get uh, see the light that's being reflected off the planet, which is also hard to do with exoplanets because they are very, very far away. But we can use uh, the light that they reflect to kind of tell what they're made out of, which is a, a little bit of harder to do with the exoplanets, but it's a really useful tool that we do have. I see we had another pre-submitted question. How could we know if life might be on an exoplanet? That is an excellent question as well. And unfortunately, it's really hard to tell because again, these are so, so far away. The closest one that we found is four light years away. 
That means it takes light. Traveling is the fastest it possibly can at the speed of light. It still takes four years to get to us. So that's really, really far away. It's really hard to see things that are really far away like that. One thing that we do is look for uh, planets that have atmospheres. An atmosphere like we have here on Earth is really important for keeping a planet kind of good normal temperatures. It can allow for liquid water to exist like we have here on Earth. And so the things that kind of keep us alive here on Earth are the kind of things that we look for when we're checking out these exoplanets. So it's got to be like just the right distance from the star, got to maybe have an atmosphere if we can detect some clouds or maybe detect even some water vapor, that's a good sign too. But again, it's really, really hard to do. Those are excellent questions. Tara, what I just flew us to here is the nearest exoplanet, Proxima b. Proxima Centauri b. Yeah, I was looking a little bit about this and I actually did the math at 40 light years away, it would take at our current fastest possible speed that we can go. We have a spacecraft that's gone 266,000 kilometers an hour. So it's really, really fast, but even at that speed, it would take us 17,166 years to get to this exoplanet. And that's the closest one. So pretty tricky. I don't see any more questions coming in. So with that, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. Thank you guys again for joining us today for the weirdest exoplanets. I do want to invite you to join us again on July 16th. We have a, Fisk has a new podcast that we've launched. It's called A View from Earth. And on July 16th, we'll have an episode that's all about exoplanets. We'll be talking with two experts in the field who study those hot Jupiters and especially exoplanet atmospheres. So we're going to talk a lot about that on the podcast. So check out our website for that. And definitely come back next week for Dome to Home. We're going to be talking about dark matter, which is one of the weirdest and craziest things that we have found in the universe. So same bat time, same bat channel, 12, or sorry, two o'clock on Tuesday next week. From all of us here at Fisk, we hope to see you again. Great. Thanks so much, everybody.